Hey, what's going on, everyone? Before we get into our conversation, I want to let you know this podcast is sponsored by BetRivers.com. BetRivers.com, the best place for all your sports gambling needs. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. You can also watch all of these episodes on the Field of 68 YouTube channel. Now, let's get into our conversation. What's going on, everyone? This is Eric Devendorf, your host of the Scores Table podcast. And we had this gentleman on before, but we love him so much, we're going to have him on again. Uh -huh. uh, he, he's an SU great, uh, but he's he's a better person than he is basketball player. I will say that. One of my good friends, my guy, Ryan Blackwell, a.k.a. Danny Glover. <laughs> <laughs> Yo. That's off the top yeah. of the head. Bro, off the top of the head. <laughs> Uh, nothing still beats the John Gillen road session on the train in New York City. CJ Fair could attest to that, and everybody else. That was the best. Black, he could he couldn't take it. He was trying to defend himself. I was I had like a shield. It was just like boom, boom, boom. It was just I, I was just. Half of it didn't even make sense, but it was just so funny. That's, <laughs> that, was, man, bro, it was absolutely one hundred percent. I was destroying. Right. Uh, yeah. So, uh, man, I want to start. Let's talk about this transfer stuff going on, man. This shit is. I mean, we got kids transferring three, four times. Like Black, here's my take. So, I understand. Like, if you really, if you know, have a legit reason to leave. All right, I got a personal reason. I don't get along with a coach, whatever it is. And you know, we got these kids, and I'm not saying this is just general the landscape of college basketball. We got kids who you know, their coach yells at them or they don't get the playing time they think they should or somebody from the outside say, and now they want to go leave and go somewhere else. And and that's when you get, I mean, these kids, like I said, transferring three, four times. I don't know, like, I, I get it. Like, I want to give these kids the freedom to be able to play right away. But, I mean, it's crazy what you see. Like, I mean, these kids, and it's different for me, like, because the, the minute these kids hit, hit a wall or hit some adversity, I, I just feel like they can't. They don't push through, or like the mindset isn't there. What is, I mean, what's your take on everything going on? And I see it, you know, at the high school level a little bit too when, you know, I have kids that aren't playing as much as they think they should be playing. And, you know, the especially with the parents are like, oh, you're better than these kids. You should be starting. You know, it's – and then that's a different level in the college because in high school you really have to stay where you are. You're not going to really – you can't switch high schools really unless you're like – you know, at a private school or something like that. So, you know, I went through the transfer thing, but there was only like one or two, maybe tops on a team that would transfer per year. Now you see, unfortunately, with Syracuse women's team, 10. Like, what Black, is the, you get, It's thousands of people in the portal. It doesn't make any sense. You know, I, I don't get it. I know kids want to play and they maybe they want to be closer to home or maybe they're getting information. But I feel like it's a fad, too, just like the, the prep school thing. Because when we were in high school, when I was in high school, no one went to prep school unless you didn't have the grades. That's the only reason people went prep. Now people are just going prep. It's like the thing to do. Kids are like, I'm going to reclassify. I'm leaving after my junior year of high school, and I'm going here and here. It's like people just follow a wave and just follow what everybody else is doing. And you look, know, bro, just, I, again, sorry to cut you off, but uh, again, like, I get, like, if you have a reason, like you said, I went to Oak Hill for my last year but because of my grades, though. And because, like, all right, you get a chance to go to Oak Hill, you're going to go to Oak Hill and play. Like, that's just, right. how, that, that's just right. what it is. But, like, and you're going to get better regardless. Exactly. But, no, 100%. I'm just saying, like, like you said, like, now, like, you, you see, like, oh, like, people, oh, I'm going, I'm going to, uh, hey, I'm announcing I'm going to, <laughs> you know, uh, San <laughs> Come on, San Diego Tech, and like, dude, like, okay, all right, I get it, like, but man, just, just do it, like, hey, had a press release, do somebody, have somebody do it, like, it's just crazy to me, man. Like, back to the now, like you said, they they're using social media, which they should. Everybody uses that the platform to say, uh, <laughs> announcement coming soon. I got seven schools where I'm gonna, you know, announce where I'm going to. It's just like, come on, just figure yeah. it out. It just just figure, and it's just i don't know man it's i guess the whole landscape is is just it's different man like i mean it's so it, it's so much talent like in college basketball you see the talent like it's talent but it's not they don't have like that like you don't see more like like that and you i'm saying you always gonna have generational talent like guys who's like damn like all right he got it mm -hmm. super athletic but that mind's like you don't have that mindset 
consistent like you used to. Am I tripping or? No, I think, and I don't want to say, but people are just so delusional sometimes at this, at some time in the stage of their career. It's like, because people are telling them they're so good without putting the work in. And then, like you said, the adversity part, you hit a little bit of adversity and you're like, well, I'm going to quit or I'm going to go somewhere else because I didn't, you know, I didn't think what, you know, I didn't get the playing time or I, yeah. People are soft. Kids are soft these days. Not all, but some. Like when you see that many kids transfer, what are you transferring for? You know, after your first year, I transferred from Illinois because Lou Henson left and the guy who I'd known forever, Jimmy Collins, didn't get the job. You know, it wasn't like, you know, I didn't get as much playing time as my freshman, but I needed to learn and I needed to get better and I needed to grow and I knew that. So I was okay with that, you know? So I didn't just transfer just because things didn't go my way. Yeah. You know, and, and, I think that's I what people are doing. And, and Black, I get, like I said, I want to keep saying, reiterating, like I get like it's situations where you're going to transfer, like, because now we're going to put it on the other side. Like it's some coaches who like, you'd be like, damn, how the hell is he a coach? Like what? You know what I mean? Whatever it is, yeah, that, yeah. that, that shit happens. So that's that's legitimate. But it's just, I mean, overall, man, like, damn. And I'm not, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be like an old head or like, yeah. Come on, man. Like I'm a hoop head, man. I really like. I I, I have passion for the game, and I and I understand it. I feel I I really understand it. So like, I don't know. Some kids, and and now the coach is more like you really got to relate to these kids, right? You mm -hmm. really got to. It's it's more like a. It, it, it's more like a psychology when it comes to it, but I don't know, man. I don't know. It's it's different across the board. It's different across the board. It's just it's obvious. To, just looking at Syracuse in itself, the number of kids are transferring in the men's team and the women's team. It's just it's crazy. It's a different time for sure. No, it's it's different. Let's uh let's talk about you just growing up because you you were born in Chicago, but you you know you played high school in in Rochester and Pittsburgh. Tell me who, you know, who put the hand, ball in your hand at first? What kind of got you interested in the game? And um, you know, talk about that growing up. Yeah, my dad was in athletics. You know, my dad was a football, basketball, track guy growing up. So he was in the sports. Um, and I was at my older brother who was in the sports as well. And, uh, you know, my dad would take us out, teach us how to play golf. He would, you know, teach us how to, you know, throw a baseball, throw a football um be physical with us he would take us in the driveway or take us to the park and teach us how to play basketball but he never forced it on us which was great he just was the type of dude that said if this is what you want to do you do it you just work at it he never was like you we're going to the gym i'm going to make you work out for you know every day three hours a day i'm going to get you yeah. trainers we didn't have trainers back then anyway you know <laughs> right. but, but we gravitated toward it and we loved it and i just loved the game and uh, the people I was around, so when I moved to Champaign after Chicago, um, I befriended uh, my Anthony Coombs, who was a childhood friend of mine, whose dad was the assistant coach for Illinois at that time, Mark Coombs. And his great uncle was Lou Henson. Mark Coombs' uncle was Lou Henson. So Anthony's great uncle was Lou Henson. They lived, we all lived literally in the same neighborhood. So we played on the same teams as the third, fourth, fifth grade, um, and then in middle school. And then I was a ball boy for Illinois. Um, so I really learned to play basketball really with, with those guys, my brother going to, you know, Lou Henson camps, uh, you know, with my dad and then, you know, being around and, and Mark Coombs just really, we'd go play three on three with him. And they really just taught us how to play the game the right way, literally fundamentals. Uh, he'd have us playing two on two, one on one, three on three, and really would just demonstrate and then go into to the camps and then go into the practices um, the Illinois practice with Kenny Battle, Kendall Gill, wow. Nick and Marcus Libra. I literally was at practice a couple of times a week or on the weekends, going to the games as a ball boy. So really fell in love with the game uh, at that time. Yeah, so, yeah, you was already in your blood. Like, you, from a young fella, you kind of – the game was already in you. Oh, it was around it. You could just imagine yeah. as a little kid, just we, we played all day, all night, and we had a, a hoop um, in our driveway, and I literally – would at night would just turn on the lights and it'd be dark and be like one o'clock and my, my parents would have to come up and be like, you're still shooting? You're still working on your game? Or we'd be down the street playing at the park or doing something. Uh, we loved it. Even when it was cold outside, snowing, we'd shovel or if we, you know, we'd go in the basement and do something, work on some aspect of our game. 
let me tell you guys a little bit about our partners over at Bet Rivers Sportsbook. If you haven't signed up with Bet Rivers yet, now's the time. Bet Rivers Sportsbook is offering a 250 match bonus for your first deposit. But what sets them apart is that they require just one play through to turn your bonus into cash money. When you win at Bet Rivers Sportsbook, they pay fast. And now it's even faster with rush pay instant approval for withdrawals. It's safe, it's secure, it's reliable. With March Madness right around the corner, there's never been a better time to give Bet Rivers Sportsbook a try. Go to betrivers.com today or download the Bet Rivers iOS app. Must be 21 years or older. Gambling problem? Call telephone number 1 800 Gambler. You got to love it. Like, the, like, first off, like, you, you can't force them. You're not, if, if you're forced, you're not going to work at it consistently. You're going to, it's going to be, you know, broken up to where you, when you're working on your game. But if you love it and you enjoy it, you're going to do it without on your own. And that's try, you try to tell these kids that, like, I mean, you know, it's, you can work on it when we're here, but you got to do it by yourself. Like, you got to, and then you got to enjoy to do it. Like, you got to enjoy the process to, to, to get better, right? Yeah, I think it's, it's bad because people think that just because you're sending your kid to a specialist or a trainer or something like that, that they're, that's going to get it done. But if the right. kid isn't going, you know, that's only 45 minutes a couple times a week. If you're not going, and I'm pretty sure you're the same way, hours at a time, playing one on zero by yourself, working on the moves that you were taught by that trainer, you know, and, and trying to utilize that into the game situation and playing pickup all the time and going to the parks and stuff you're really not going to get better and it's not going to show. Right. It got to be committed. This is like every day, like it's really had to be, if you really want to get to a higher level, like where yourself and I played or NBA, whatever it is, you got to do it every day. Like some, right. I mean, you just got to, that's how committed you got to be. Well, that's why buddies had so much success, you know, because people doubted him, you know, it was like, Oh, he's not going to play because of his dad. But you and I both know you work with him a lot and I worked him a little bit you know, sparingly and coach McCants and stuff. But every time I was in the mellow, we were in the mellow. He was there yeah. and he wanted to be there. And he did the extra stuff. He was in the weight room with Ryan, you know, um, he just worked at it. And that's what just kids have to do. And that's why he's having the success at Syracuse when people didn't think he'd even have a chance. So we talk about, you go to Rochester, you, you move to Rochester, Pittsburgh. And I mean, like your high school career, your parade all American, one of the top recruits in the country. So talk about that process, moving, going, you know, transitioning, because that's a far move for real. And then, uh, you know, the success you had in high school and then also your recruitment process. Yeah, it was crazy. It was um, after my eighth grade year, we moved. It was harder for my brother because he had just finished his sophomore year of high school. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, we were angry. We didn't want to move. And we ended up moving to, you know, Pittsburgh and um, my freshman year, AU started to really pick up. In like the nineties. Yeah. And you know, guys like Mickey Walker had teams and I played with this guy, Rich Hill. And I had, to, I had so much more exposure to different things and different tournaments. And I think it was just good for me on uh, a different style of basketball, you know, Midwest and then coming to the East coast, it was a little bit different and yeah. playing at Rochester and then going to the tournaments on the East coast. And I remember going to, you know, five-star camp and a couple of other ones on the East coast and people really started to, you know, recognize my talents and I started to grow and I started to, you know, thin, get thinner um, and shape up a little bit. So, you know, it was weird just getting your first letter and then, you know, Jim Beheim coming to, you know, some games and practices or Bernie Fine hit me up and uh, it was a great, great experience. I remember one summer league game, I had like Beheim there with Jim Calhoun and John Thompson and you have nine D1 coaches come to see like a summer league game. Yeah. You know, at the time I was like, man, that's crazy. But looking back, it was, you know, that's pretty cool. I mean, that means you're doing something right and you're working at it. So, you, I mean, you chose Illinois. You know, why, why, I mean, you, you're right there in Rochester. Why not choose Syracuse just first? Why it was that, that connection you had early on? I had that connection and uh, people never realized that or understood it, but I mean, just imagine growing up in Syracuse and being a ball boy and being literally being around those guys. I was like That's part of right. the family um, and just wanting to go. If you wanted to go to Syracuse, you love Jim Beheim. You just love the program. That's what it was for me, you know, up until I was 14, until we moved to Rochester. So I still had that love and 
I'd always pay attention to them when I was in high school, watching Illinois, and obviously watching Syracuse too. So that was a tough decision. And I remember, um, you know, it came down to really those two teams, and uh, I made that choice. And a lot of people, obviously, in this part of the country were disappointed. Uh, but I think, you know, looking back, I made the right choice. Um, and then Lou Henson ended up retiring. They kind of forced him to retire. And then Jimmy Collins, the longtime assistant, who's actually from Syracuse. Um, wow. he, he's, he was rated the number yeah. one high school player of all time out of Syracuse. Yeah, yeah I know Jimmy Collins. Team. I know the name, First, absolutely. Yeah. He passed away recently, a couple months ago. But um, I had a great connection with him, great relationship with him. Um, just from growing up, I'd known him since I was in the third grade. So we had that connection. Um, and they passed him over for the job. And they brought in a great coach in Lon Kruger. You know, Kruger had done a great things at Florida um, the years before. It took him to a Final Four. And then um, I just said, you know, I came here to play for Lou Henson and these guys and Jimmy Collins. And, you know, that's, they're not here anymore. So it's time for me to leave. And I called Behan. And uh, oh. Go ahead. Sorry. No, it's just saying I called him and I remember he came in on the phone and, um, he, you know, he gave me the sarcastic, like, <laughs> it's about time. <laughs> <laughs> the old <laughs> Jim Bay, I'm smirking, laugh, and he was like, it's about time. But he was great for the whole process, <laughs> helped me through it because um, they actually held me. They, they thought Syracuse was tampering with me at the time. They were like, oh, they're calling. I was like, no, I, I want to leave. This is my choice. So they wouldn't release me for like a month and a half. So look, so hold on real quick. So you were there, you you, you already, were you there a full year even? I was there a full year. A full so year. So that was, was that full year under Kruger though? Or was it the other guy? This, or H after Henson, Henson. Sorry. I, so Henson, yeah. They fired Henson in March. Ah, okay, okay. Sorry. came in in April and I had already decided I was going to leave when they said he was, he was getting the boot, he was getting fired. And then they passed over Jimmy Collins bringing in Lon Kruger in April. And I said, this was after my freshman year. I said, okay, it's time for me to go. And yeah. they didn't okay. want to release me. They didn't want to let me go. Um, you know, so it literally took a month and a half. Like, think about this now. The portal is wide open. If you want to transfer, you can transfer. Nobody's saying anything. Yeah. Just imagine 25 years ago, I'm saying, I want to transfer. I need to go. And they're like, no, we think you need to stay. We think Syracuse is tampering with you take your time. Cause I had connections, friends that I grew up with whose parents worked for the university. So they'd okay. have them call me or bring me into a meeting and say, Ryan, we think you should stay. We should reconsider stay at Illinois. And I was like, no, I have my mind made up. So finally after like a month and a half, they gave me my release and let me transfer. Wow. So what, yeah. so what was, what was, that's crazy. What, so what was the reaction when you came back? to Syracuse obviously I mean after your family's happy you're coming back in the area but yeah what was that was like for great you? all my friends I went to high school with were really excited because they're all Syracuse fans um I think it was just it felt right it felt like I got that out of the way the Illinois part you know that dream of playing for Illinois and for Lou Henson and those guys yeah and I got out of the way it felt like it worked out the way it was supposed to work out for a reason because that was my dream I fulfilled that and then I came back to Syracuse and had, you know, a good career um, and some great experiences, made great friends. And obviously I'm here now again. I'm still here. So it's, been, it's worked out. Yeah, I mean, you had a great career. You averaged 12, 8, and 3. Oh, I mean, it, for your career. So 12 points, 8. I mean, super, super, super solid career. But talk about that first year uh, coming back into Cuse. And it kind of was, I don't know, it, it, you, you were playing at Illinois for one year, so it's a little bit of a transition coming into a, you know, a different system, coach, a different coach, Coach Beheim. Talk about, you know, how coach was that first year. And then was there somebody, you know, coach, player, who, who you really connected with, who really helped you that, you know, that first time? Well, coach is always great. And the, the good thing was I set out the first year, you know, the transfer where you had to sit out a year, which I think yeah. really helped me um, in school. Uh, got ahead of the school, got in the weight room, did what I needed to do, you know, got acclimated to the school and the system and how coach, coach, even though I didn't play in the games. You know, I was at practice every day and I was working hard. And I think that mentally and physically I got better. And I think it showed when I, you know, my first uh, season as a sophomore. Um, I think I had a lot of success and I think I fit right in um, to the team. We had some good players, Todd Bergen, you know, Maris Danulis and, you know, Eton and Jason, we had a good 
good group of guys. Um, and we had ended up making the Sweet 16 that year. And, you know, coach is great. You know, he lets you play, as you know. If, if Even if I wasn't scoring, I knew that if I just did the other things, if I rebounded, played defense and made plays and just played hard, um, that's what he wants. And I knew that. So, you know, that's why I had some success. So that, I, we'll go back to that. So that redshirt year, you come in, you learn in the zone for the first time. How long did it take you really to, like, where, all right, I know the rotations. I know how to kind of cheat it a little bit, get back here. How, how long did that take? Not too long, to be honest with you. Um, smart player. You're think, a smart player. Yeah, I think I would say for, you know, I give myself a little bit of credit. I have a pretty good IQ and understand the game pretty good. So, um, and then we also played man. So we did both. And obviously, coming from Illinois, we were all man team. Yeah. Uh, to come into Syracuse, we're, you know, a lot of zone and a little bit of man. So, I think it was a good mix and I understood it both sides pretty well and it worked out. Yeah. So that, and, and we'll go back to talking about that sweet 16 run. I remember I was in Saginaw, Michigan at my boy house, you know, we're, we're Michigan state. We, we, we're in Michigan, you know, so we're watching the game and I think it, that first half you guys were doing, doing what you had to do. And that second half, I think I remember the alley you Mateen Cleves through the Morris Peterson on that baseline. And that kind of opened up everything. But I, I do remember that game. And that was kind of oh, that was uh, 2000. Yeah, that was a couple of years later, senior year. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Was, yeah. Um, OK. So, uh, that's it was. But that was Sweet 16, though. That was Sweet 16. And, exactly. Yeah. That, that was Sweet 16. I remember I remember that at the Palace of Auburn Hills. That was a home game for them, man. And they you know, obviously they were, everybody talked about them. That was probably Michigan State's maybe not most talented, but most well-rounded team, I think, with Mateen Cleaves, and um, they had uh, coming off Jason Bridges, who was a freshman. Um, they had Bell. Andre, Andre Hudson. Andre Hudson was a solid. They had Bell. They had Granger. Um, and they had – A.J. Granger. Tough, physical. They were a physical team, could shoot. And um, they had Morris Peterson, obviously, another first-round pick who was yeah. great. All those – the kids from Flint. Yeah. And uh, we were up and literally – it was like the air was taken. We didn't score for 10 minutes. I've watched the game several times. And uh, I, I counted, you know, I looked at the minutes from the time to score. And I think it was like nine or 10 minutes. We literally didn't score a bucket. So, what was it, though? What was it? It was just, I mean. You know, we probably should have gone into Eton a little bit more. We probably okay. should have. <laughs> okay, talk to me about it. <laughs> we probably should have. Looking back, and now that I'm older and I'm a coach now, and I analyze the game and look at pick apart the game a little bit differently. I think we should have utilized him a little bit more. Um, but Michigan State was a great team. They ended up winning it. You know, they just yeah, yeah. went on a run. They had the crowd and the momentum and the energy behind them. I mean, literally 20,000 fans were all green and all, you know, rooting for them. So uh, it was just one of those things that they were on a mission. I think it was just their year and they ended up winning it, which was made us feel a little bit better. Well, was that – well, I guess what was your most memorable – moment in SU history. I know that had to be, or at your SU career, I know that had to be one of them, but I guess you could either pick personally or, you know, team-wise, what was your most memorable moment? I think most memorable was always going to be the St. John's game sophomore year, my first year playing. Now look, hold on, Black. That's that, So, okay, I'll just skip right to it because that was the fan question. Okay. So I'll let you talk about it. Go ahead, talk about it. Go ahead. Yeah, it was just, I mean, first of all, playing in the garden, there's nothing like it, as you know. There's nothing like playing in Madison Square Garden. And the energy that you have that's there in the building, it's just a different vibe. Um, you know, I think we were, we'd already beat Villanova, and then we played St. John's. They had Ron Artest and Felipe Lopez and then in Hamilton. They had some, they had a solid team. And Fran Fraschilla was the coach. Yeah. Um, and I think I turned the ball over to give them, I think we were up like four. I remember driving to the basket and uh, I turned the ball over and went off my knee. What coach and say? What coach, what coach? Actually come down. coach was so mad at me too. I could just remember, I remember it vividly. You remember when coach yells at you sometimes, his litter jacket almost came off. He did the, when the jacket almost comes off and it's down by, you know, by his side and he brings it back up. He was so pissed at me. And Ty Berg was like, <laughs> don't look at, Ty Berg was like, don't even look at him. Don't even look at him. And I was like, I was like, okay, I'll make up for it somehow. I remember getting a steal um, towards the end of the game. Ron Artest hits a three. 
to tie it up and we come down and Ty Bergen, you know, we spread it out one four, like always. And he's dribbling and he trips. I don't know if it's a travel, but I just know that I was like, I'm open. <laughs> and he got it to me. And I, you know, I think I jabbed left and Ron Artest kind of fell a little bit, one dribble shot game over. So and that's history. And, uh, and so Russ, one of the best defenders of all time that you, you talk about, when you say fall, that's a, yeah. Yeah, I always, I made him fall, and it's on video. <laughs> okay, well, I just want to get that out to you. He stumbled. He stumbled a little bit, but, yeah, he's he was a competitor. That dude was tough. Undersized, but he played like he was seven feet. You know, he was big, he was strong, big shoulders, strong hands. Um, and we always had some good battles, always, when we played against each other. You gave you gave him the old stumblerina. Stumblerina. Gave him a little shimmy to the left, dribble, one dribble. Game time. So, but that's what, but like, that's a, that's what your game, like you were like a, you were a guy, you were a bigger guard, a bigger, I guess, forward, but you could handle the ball and you could make decisions. Like coach would, I saw, I saw a tape before where you could, you just come down the middle and you just, you'd make a decision or catch it in that high post, being that trail guy and then just go like, kind of, kind of like, I mean, what he lets Marek do, right? I mean, it was like, Absolutely. you were that, but you were, you were that guy, you know, make, making that decisions. I mean, how was that yeah, freedom? Okay. How was that freedom, though? That for it was coach? great. Um, yeah. He allowed me to do some things, and it, it took pressure off Jason Hart because there were some times where Jason would, like, you bring it up, you know, because he's getting pressure yeah. and he's having to make plays. And that's not always easy as a guard. It, it wears you out. It tires you out. And, you know, there were times when I'd help him out and bring the ball up, and then we had a set, a 50 series, where Jason, you know, he would come off screens off the baseline. I would handle the ball, and I would try to get those guys open. So – you know, we had good chemistry. We had some good pieces. And uh, I just think being able to do multiple things, for me, I was kind of like the Google guy, like Marek. Um, I think that was valuable for the team. So, Yeah, one of the most valuable guys on the team. I mean, if not the. It just it just makes everything come together, put guys in their spots, positions, like unselfish, like the guys you just want to play with. And every team needs those. You know that. You know, you got scores yeah. like yourself. Not everybody can be a scorer. Not everybody can just shoot the ball. You're not going to have those guys. So you need guys willing to do the little things, the rebound, play defense, die for loose balls, you know, get in the passing lanes, whatever it may be, just the little things. Yeah. Things all that don't show up in the stat sheet, for sure. Make the, ex, make the extra pass, the hockey assist. Yeah. Guys are moving the ball. Like, that's that, – I want to play with those guys who know how to play. Yes, know how to play. Simple things, little things. Yeah, that's too many too I see too many guys thinking they scoring the ball so well like you're a diamond dozen like what else can you bring to the table because can you set a screen enough. are you setting screens are you boxing out when you're supposed to box out are you you know do you know how to read screens or read defenses and, and offenses and make the simple plays can you move without the ball can you score without the ball in your hand you know little things like that that I think people don't really it's under, you know, undervalued, I think, in the game of basketball, the little things. Yeah, that's going to get you playing. Now, don't get a jumper and a little handle and know how to, you know what I mean? Now it's you in the NBA. Complete. I mean, you in the NBA. Well, that's why Michael Jordan, is, in my opinion, is the best player ever because he did all those yeah. things. Yeah, he's the best player ever, in my opinion, too. I mean, say what you yeah. want to say, but it is. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we know, that, we know the answer to that. That was uh, – <laughs> So look at the fan question was about that game. When you when you hit that shot, what was the reaction of Ron Ron Artest and Coach Fran Fraschilla after that shot? I don't know. If, or what do you remember? Like seeing Fran Fraschilla thought I traveled. He literally jumped up and down. You got to go watch. Jumped up and down. Was doing this the whole time. Thought, <laughs> thought Todd Bergen traveled. Um, Tyrone Grant just took the ball and threw it. Ron Artest was just like, whatever. What are we supposed to do? Yeah, um, so it was Queens Bridge. I literally Queens was just Bridge. jumping up and down because I'm in the garden. I'm, you know, looking back, I was like a little kid, like 19 years old, whatever, just happy that we won the game. And I made up for my mistake a couple of possessions before earlier in the game. And, you know, because I let my team down. So, and to see them run off the bench and everybody just, I literally ended up on the other side of the court somehow. I was literally just bouncing up and down for like 20 seconds, ended up on the other side of the court and everybody tackled me. So that's a great memory, great feeling that, you know, obviously you can't get back and always going to be there, you know. Man, in the garden, bro, best place to play in the world, Madison Square Garden. I don't care what you tell me. 
until you played there, until you did something on there, danced on their box. Man, yeah. it's great. How, I mean, I know it was, it was packed. It was all orange. Oh, it was great, man. And and obviously St. John's, we played St. John's, which is, you know, a New York City team. Yeah. Um, and but we're really, we're really was. New York, though. We're New York, though. We're the team. That, you know? Absolutely. But St. John's, yeah. the history of the Big East. Right. Obviously, the, they created um, – so the aura around the league – and the Big East tournament and everything was just to be able to compete at that level and to be able to hit a shot like that is just, you'll never forget anything like that. No question. So how would you sum up your, your overall experience at Q's, your career, you know, or just everything that you went through up there? Man, it was great. It was a great school. Um, I learned a lot, learned, you know, I grew as a person. And the thing about me is, I always knew that regardless of basketball, I was going to get my education. My parents always preached education. My mom was a teacher. My dad was a teacher in education before he got into the Boy Scouts. And, you know, it was like, you're going to play basketball for how long? If, if you get to the NBA, if you go overseas, you can make some money and do that. That's great. But you got to have an education. I knew that. And then I'm the type of person. This is why I went overseas, too, and enjoyed it. Was in Japan for eight years. Uh, was in France, England, Portugal, you know, went to Lebanon for a month doing some stuff with Ronnie Cycli. So I enjoyed, you know, meeting people, learn about cultures and just, I think growing mentally, I think it helps you to do different things. I think too many times, um, you know, players just think, well, I got to just worry about basketball and that's it. If I don't make it in the basketball world or athletic world, then, you know, life isn't complete or I can't do anything else. And I never thought that way. So I enjoyed my time. Met a lot of good people, a lot of good connections. And as you do, you've learned to do that as well as you've gotten older. You know, that's what makes the world work, your connections with people. Um, and so I tried to do that as much as possible. Yeah, absolutely. They, so just being at Q's already puts you in that mindset, you know, to whatever I'm going to go through. This is one hell of an experience, one hell of a ride for real, right? <laughs> Absolutely. It's very unique university. Um, all the people, all the, you know, powerful and famous people that have come from Syracuse, uh, you know, from the school of, new, you know, the new house or communications or whatever. Um, Joe Biden, people like that. It's just a great university. Um, and we obviously try to represent it as, as well as we can. No question. You, give me your favorite. Favorite Coach Bayheim story, you know, we, we you know, it's one of the questions I ask everyone because I just love to hear. It could be practice. Hey, me, hey, give me some. He's on the chair. He just fucking sitting here. And then it's just like, hey, fucking. You suck. <laughs> give me some after the game before in the locker room halftime. Fucking oh, man. Todd. Well, do you say Todd? We used to mess with, you said Todd? <laughs> yeah, I was just, that's my guy, TB. Shout out TB, man. That's my you want to get? I'll give you a Todd Blumen story. It's really funny. No, oh Todd Blumen. I was talking about Todd Bergen. Oh Todd Bergen. Well, TB is oh, my Todd guy. Bergen. Well, Todd Bergen got so one time we're we're in the huddle, okay, and uh, something's going on. Todd made a mistake or missed some shots or whatever, and coach is trying to talk to him. We're all in the huddle, and uh, Todd's like <laughs> Detroit, you know, three one three. Like he goes. It's cool, baby. <laughs> it's cool, baby. <laughs> Coach goes, I'm not your fucking baby, Todd. He Todd goes, all right, baby, it's cool. and Everything's going to be all right. He goes, I already fucking told you. I'm not your fucking baby. <laughs> and we were all looking at each other like, oh, my God, this is crazy. So I, I, I always tell Todd and remind him of that story. And he always laughs. He laughs. But Come on, man. You call Coach Baby. I'm not your fucking He baby. said, he goes, it'll be cool, baby. It's okay, baby. And he's like, <laughs> not your fucking baby, Todd. Don't call me your fucking baby. Not your fucking baby. We're all, we're like, oh, boy. This is great. <laughs> Yo, give me give me a Todd Blumen story, though, because Todd is the greatest. Oh, man. So, you know, so back then it was, it was uh, we had the VCR. For right. the tape, you know, nothing digital, not like it is now and high tech. He had to have the tape and put it in at the hotel the night before games to, to watch film on the team. 
Okay, yeah. so we decide we'd always mess with Ty. We throw peanuts at him on the plane or do some just to mess with him because you know we have to mess with Ty. Just that's what we do. That's that. so one time. <laughs> one time I said, "This is what I'm going to do." All right. He had walked out of the room, and Coach would always come in after we'd eat, you know, our dinosaur barbecue, and then we'd go sit in there. So while nobody was paying attention, I walked into the room, the film room, and I took a porno tape that I'd found or had or something, I don't know. <laughs> and I you put had it, it. You had I it. put it in the VCR. So when coach said, roll the film, start the film, it was gonna be porno. And you know, Todd would have flipped. But I don't know, for some reason, this one time, because he was so anal about it, he walked in and checked the VCR to make sure the tape was in there for some reason, just because he didn't want it to be messed up. He knew coach would yell at him. Yeah. So he goes in there and he, he at the last second he checks, he looks at it. He goes, what the fuck is this? He ejected it, looks at it. He goes, you fucking guys need to grow up and fucking threw the tape against the wall and stormed out. Literally was pissed. And coach came in because he saw Todd in the hallway. He goes, what the fuck is wrong with him? What the fuck did you guys do to him? <laughs> I think I told him. We might have, somebody told him. But I was like, Coach, sorry, we were messing with him, blah, blah, blah. He just kind of laughed. He was like, hey, you guys are crazy. They put the other tape in, but Ty was, oh, he was so mad that day. He was so yeah. mad at us. Yeah, bro. I got two I got two unbelievable stories, though. And I, I'll just keep it. I told it before. Matty Gorman with the birthday boy was unbelievable. This oh, that's, like, that's a great story. That's a great story. I, and, and so I'll go to the other one that I had. Um Thing. okay look we're so same thing we're coming in filming a hotel we're sitting in there Murph saying something or some like <laughs> you know Bruce sitting there you know he, fucking, <laughs> at, at, at the computer like just fucking waiting Murph saying something they like whispering shit like saying something like titles fucking tit like just whispering <laughs> fucking with him bro. <laughs> man no bullshit man he gets up fucking Turns around, fucking walks. Out. I'm fucking out of here. Bury this fucking. Get out of here. Same shit. Coach walking in. You hear coach. What are you? What are you doing? What are you doing? Get in there. And then he gets in there, and then he just sits down. He's like, you know, every saying, year, like, every bro, year. Just, I, I didn't do it. I didn't do it justice. But God, bro, it was just the most you know funny thing, man. But Todd, yeah. and I love Todd. I love Todd, man. It just he was like our brother. He was like our brother that we had to mess with, and he's been around for so long. And everyone from every year, a generation, Derek Coleman's got stories of him when he put him in a trash can, upside down. Like it's just Todd. That's but we love Todd. You know he does a lot for the program. He's been there forever. So yeah, he toddles. He, he's he, he's toddles. Like he's Julie toddles. said, old toddles. <laughs> man like you can't like that's his reputation and like we're all like good friends with him now yeah right like he's all yeah. he, he, he sees you like he's but it's just like that's just what it was man that was it, he's a great yeah. guy yeah he's great yeah so let's talk about you know, so after q so you, you played overseas for a while you played 10 years i think right yeah played uh and coached so i ended up overseas and for coach, a while. Right. um first stint was france ended up in france and then it just didn't work out there and end up going because the CBA drafted me number one in Gary, okay. Indiana. Frank Kendrick, who was a longtime assistant at Purdue under Gene Cady, who I knew because he recruited me heavily in high school. So I kind of knew him. And he said, you know, we're going to draft you number one. You should come back. You have a chance to get the NBA to be a yeah. good rule, which and the CBA back then was now what the G League is because there was no right. G League. This was right before, you know, Isaiah Thomas basically had to go bankrupt um the cba so very a lot of comp great competition in the cba and then i ended up going to portugal um and then england or where nick nurse was a coach the raptors coach was a, was yeah. a coach there you were in london great dude great mind i was in london yeah brighton brighton, brighton like okay. an hour right on the right on the water okay um and then went to uruguay i took like a year and a half off i was in florida teaching and doing stuff just waiting for you know the waiting game when you're waiting to go back overseas and you're like kind of I just kind of got tired of it for a little bit so I went to Florida and I taught there um and did some basketball stuff down there and um ended up going back over to Uruguay and then ended up in Japan which was a great move for me 
uh, great country, great culture. Um, so I, I enjoyed it over there. I ended up there for eight seasons, four as a player and four as a coach. And then I ended up coming back full time in 2014 when I worked at IMG. Yeah. So, I mean, talk about all those experiences just being overseas. Cause like, like we talked about earlier, you know, even if you don't make the NBA, like it's so many things you could do with this ball, right? Like you've been so many places and then you, I know I'm, yeah, obviously you learned the language Japanese and, yeah. you know, just being over there, experience that culture, like how did that change your whole mindset? Like it was our, like you said, you were already ready for it, but like, how did those, you know, those eight years or those 10 years, you know, change your whole mind experiencing those things. I wouldn't be the same person I am today. You know, I yeah. wouldn't, have to, you know, broadens your horizon and your perspective on life and on people and things and where you come from. And because sometimes we're, when you don't travel and you're just in the same place and doing the same things all the time, you think that that's all there is. I think for me, it just helped me grow. Um, you know, learning Japanese culture, or being in France or being in Portugal and just, traveling around those countries and getting to know people and learn about their cultures and understand how things work there. So, I mean, it was great. I really loved it. Japan, especially because I'd spent so much time there and met my wife there. Um, so that was a really good experience for me. Yeah. And even when I was just in France, I would go travel and just travel to different places around Europe. Um, so it was just great. So you're, I mean, you came back to QS. Uh, you got got into coaching in high school right after. I mean, yeah, so after no, right away, you you went to IMG, like you said. So, so. I re, I was going to retire from playing. I was thinking about retiring. I was like 33, I think, okay. Osaka, 2012. And I, was, I actually was going to go back and play. Um, but the year before, my agent had asked me during my last year playing if I was interested in coaching uh, because the owner and GM of my team in Osaka was thinking about making a coaching change and you know, I was still kind of wanted to play a little bit, um, but body was starting to break down and I was going to go back and play. And then um, they fired the coach and they couldn't, the coach that they wanted, I think, went somewhere else. So they called me up and said, you can come be our coach. If you want to coach and not play. And I just thought about the future um, and the pay was more. So I think it was a no brainer. That's really just, I kind of just fell into it. So then you go to IMG and then you and went to then IMG. I, so I coached there two years in Osaka, two years in Guma, which is near Tokyo, and then uh, came back home and then took a job at IMG for like six, seven months. And then uh, Ben Bellucci, who's a friend of ours, um, was going to be the GM of, which is now the Syracuse Stallions. They wanted to start an ABA, which you remember. I remember, I, you I remember talking about it with you. Yeah. So yes. you were going to play for us. Yes, yes. And so that's why I left IMG uh, and came back here to do that. And it didn't work out. And then Lazar Sims, um, who knew Ari Lieberman, the AD at Liverpool, introduced me to him and then just kind of fell into that. And I've been there ever since. So, I mean, you've done a, I mean, amazing job. State championship, undefeated season. I mean, winning records every single season. How is that coaching at that level, dealing with those those kids, you know, still growing, right? Still, mine's still growing. So, like, and you're more, and I've seen you with them, like, you're you're awesome. Like, we're just with, you know, besides the basketball stuff, just being relatable to the kids, and they they love you. They want to play for you. Like, we talk about that, you know, whole transition from, you know, grown men to now, yeah. you know, coaching these kids develop. Yeah, it's been, I mean, as much as it, I would hope, that it's helped them and I've helped them grow. I mean, it's helped me grow as a person, as a coach, you know, having to deal with them, 14, 15, 16 year old kids are still growing, um, you know, mentally and physically, especially if they, they need the guidance a lot. Um, and not even just the basketball stuff, the outside, off the court, you know, having them realize that education is important and that, you know, a lot of times I think, like I said before, these kids are just looking to go play basketball and they think that that's their only way. And so it's hard to get them to understand that education is important, you know, necessarily, not necessarily you're gonna make the NBA or even make division one, division two or division three. You might have to go to JUCO or you might just have to go get a job or get your degree. And so, you know, it's, it's hard to get them to understand that, but I love it, that's the challenge. 
that's a challenge to work with them on a daily basis. And they're not all from the same place or the same background or have the same parenting. Um, so to try to mold them, you know, together as a group. And then when you win, it's fun. You know, when you win, it's always fun. Yeah. Everything's fun when you win. So we've had a lot of success. But the, the best part about it is just getting to know the kids and working with them in practice and trying to get them better and trying to mold them. So it's been a fun experience and a fun ride for sure. So, I mean, you, you've hit game win shots in the garden. I mean, you've hit big shots in your Q's career, played with, you know, pros. But, I mean, the impact that you're having on these kids besides basketball, like the everlasting impact, like when they – how does it feel like when they're coming back from – because the, the way you can really tell if you have impact if they come back when they're done playing, right? And, that, and, I've seen, and I've seen these kids come back, you know, to the gym with, you know, Liverpool and – like, what's the comparison? Like, how does that feel? You, you did this, but then, like, does this feel better? The thing, you know, what you I've had kids, and I'm a, I'm a TA, so I work in the school as well. So I work with the, you know, right. the general population of the kids and I get to know them as well. So I'm, I'm just as passionate about that and working with the kids in general as I am with the game of basketball. So when a kid, I've had a kid, kids tell me, you inspired me. I want to be like you when I grow up. I think that's. I think that lets me know that I'm doing something right. When they come up to me and say, you you inspired me, coach or Mr. Blackwell, like, you know, you've done a lot for me or all right, they give me notes or they text me or send me an email or something like that saying, you've you've helped me along the way somehow. Or the kids like Charles and they come back and they, they're appreciative of what we've tried to do for them. I think that's what it's about. That That's what it's about. You you doing your job, like, yeah, yeah like, when you're doing stuff like that, like that's what you're supposed to do. Like that was what was meant for you, right? Like all the search, you ain't even got to search. Like it's already in you, right? That's what you It's a natural, it's natural. And it's natural yeah. for me to, like you said, to, I enjoy being around them. And I'm not, you know, I just try to teach them the way I've been taught. And some take to it, some don't. It's hard because we're not their parents. We're not with them 24 seven. You know, I can only tell them certain things and maybe they'll get it. Some will. Some of them won't, but you still try, you know, and I, I'm not the type that yells and I'm not going to get mad if, you know, for whatever reason, if a kid's not that good or is not improving like we think he should. So, cause every kid is different, but again, it's just, I'm passionate about doing it. I love the kids, I, you know, on the court, off the court for me, that's, it's great. So, so ultimately, I mean, where do you want to go with, with this coach? And I know you want to, you know, I know you love coaching high school. You do a great job at it. You do a great job with the kids. But ultimately, I feel like you want to go up a college, MBA. I mean, are those your aspirations or goals? Absolutely. I think, I, I think I'm good enough. You know, like, like we say as basketball players, I'm good enough to play at that level. I'm good enough to coach at the next level. And I know that. I know sometimes it takes time. It's got to be the right fit. You know, try to get the one job last year um, or two years ago and didn't work out. But. You know, I've had some opportunities to go D3, but it wasn't – that wouldn't be a good fit. I have a great thing what's going on at Liverpool, but at some point I definitely want to move on um, and try my hand at the next level for sure. And by the way, if anyone goes inside that Liverpool gym, that is like a a college uh, – It's you know what I mean? Like the track around, the weight room right in – like that's college stuff. That So they – whoever goes there, they transition they, nicely. I'll say this. Shout out to, you know, our administrators, um, Mark Potter, uh, who's the superintendent, Ari Lieberman, athletic director, and Dan here, and all these guys, Tim Manning. They've done a remarkable job, and they're great to work for because they've allowed us to do things during the pandemic within reason, within the rules during the pandemic. A lot of people were scared to let their coaches do anything and they allowed us to get in the gym and have the kids get in the gym because you know one of the things during the pandemic these kids needed an outlet these kids weren't doing anything they were sitting at home Absolutely. playing video games all day every day so I think it was good that you know we were lucky and fortunate that we were allowed to work um, and do some things uh, on the court and in the weight room like a lot of skills and drills and weight room stuff which was good for us I needed to get out of the house and it's good for the kids too. So shout out to them for you know what they've been doing at Liverpool. Great stuff. Yeah, shout out to Liverpool. My my daughters are in the district and they do a great right. job. I think they do a great job from the bottom going up, like with the 
they, they I mean, from what I've seen, they do a great job in all sports, just just, you know, helping these kids. Absolutely. A lot of great coaches, um, you know, been great. The faculty, all the teachers. And like I said, that's a testament with the coaching specifically. You know, I think Ari Lieberman does a great job. I don't think he gives enough, gets enough credit. Um, people don't realize I'm with him every day in his office and around him a lot. So I see the things he does behind closed doors and he does a great job. Yeah. Shout out. Shout out to Ari. He's a good guy, man. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's transition a little bit. I want to talk about the Q's, the Q's team this year and just kind of give a wrap up of, of what you thought about the season, what you thought about the run. And then I want to talk about, you know, what do you think about these new guys coming in? Now we got Samir Torrance, who's transferring from Marquette, a hometown kid. Yeah. Good to see a home. Good. I mean, that, regardless of what you say, like, it's just good to see a kid from that's the great. town. Yeah. Play for a I mean, that's a dream. Like he grew up watching. Come on, man. That's a big, that's big time. Like, so shout out to Samir. That's, that's yeah. big time. But give me your thoughts on all that. So, yeah, I mean, they battle, like coach said, they've battled all year. They've gotten better. And there are a lot of games. If you go back and think from the beginning, you know, Charles is still mad about the Bryant game because Bryant could have beat him. <laughs> yeah. Charles always, he texted me right. He was so mad after the game he texted me, um, which is understandable because that's his hometown too. Same thing. Yeah. He's, Charles he's Fry, shout out to him. Kid. And uh, the Buffalo game easily could have lost that game. Um, and it could have gone the other way. We, They could have not made the tournament. But those guys, you know, to their credit, just continue to work, continue to just stick together and fight. Um, they got better and better at, towards the end of the year. And then, obviously, we know what happened, you know, the Buddy Bayheim run. Um, and it was great to watch. So, shout out to them. It's unfortunate that some of these guys are leaving, you know, Kadari and Quincy's testing the waters. I don't think Barek's coming back. Who knows what Sidibe is going to do? Um you know, but they have some experience at the guard spot with Buddy and Joe Girard and Alan Griffin. I don't know if you've heard what he's doing. Is he? No. What did, what, what did you hear? No, I don't know. I so I was asking. I'm I'm not sure if he's coming back. Um, but if it's he does, a of, it's a lot of work to do. We got. I think he's <laughs> up here. I think he's got a lot of work to do. Well, I mean, just I just mean in general, like for the team, like it's guys leaving. You know, it's. You gotta and then Benny got to put some pieces in. together. Benny Williams is supposed to be really good. I've only seen yeah. him on film, but right. you know, once he gets on the court, that's that's different. Um, you know, but coach has been around for so long and he understands how to adjust and put pieces together. Yeah. He's you know, he's one of the best guys at doing that, at, at filling in roles and putting pieces together that helps him win when people don't think he can win. And that's the same thing what happened this year. And they made a run and he he figured it out. And uh, he seems to do that year in and year out. So um, you, you, I think you coached against Samir in, uh, in high school, right? I've only seen him. We never played uh, SAS. I think it's where he okay. went, SAS. Uh, we never played them when he was in high school. But I've seen him play, you know, several times in uh, elite camp. I watched him play a little bit. And then at Marquette, he didn't really – saw a couple games where he got in sparingly uh, but didn't play a lot. But I'm happy for him. That's great that, you know, a hometown kid is coming home. And I know they offered him, and he was thinking about coming here and then decided to go. So I think it's probably good for him. Probably makes him feel good. He's coming home, be close to the family, and a place where he, you know, Syracuse, obviously, he grew up watching him and loved him, I'm sure. So that's good. That's a good story. And maybe it could be just a better fit for him. You know, I mean, sometimes those, those type of situations happen. You come here, he's comfortable. He's around his family and friends. He has that support might come in and just and really have that impact that he, you know, he's a four-star recruit coming out of high school. Right. So, he, I mean, he could play ball. You and his relationship play. with Buddy. And yeah, you know, the chemistry. And all these guys, and I think that familiarity might help. And obviously he knows Bayheim pretty well. So I think, like you said, the change of scenery and, and being around people that you know and are comfortable with being around, I think that might help his game, hopefully, because if it does, that means it's going to help us. Yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see a lot of the moves going forward. I mean, it, with Cuse and with just college basketball in general, I mean, you've seen the guy, uh, Chris Beard, going from Texas Tech right to Texas. Like, dudes, like, yeah. I mean, it's crazy out here, man. Like, that's you you just driving down the road. Yeah, and that was his alma mater, man. It's just – it's it's always interesting, interesting to see 
the coaching changes and like the circus and the carousel, just how people, it's like a revolving door, you know, shock and smart leaves and then gets picked up by Marquette uh, right away. Um, these coaches just seem to bounce around a little bit. And, and again, that's, when you think about Roy Williams, who's been at one spot for a long time, obviously he did just retire, but he was at Kansas and then Carolina for like 18, 19 years, Krzyzewski and Beheim. Other than them, nobody stays in the same place. Everyone's just, you know, it's like they recycle and just bounce around to other places. And those guys, there's a testament to them, that longevity being at one spot, that's, that's rare, very rare. And and I, I and and like you said, recycle. And they do that in the NBA too. They do all that. But yeah. It, and looking on the other side of it, it does, now it's a lot of guys who got a lot of talent in that field. And and, and mm. former player. And and look, former players. Some former players don't make good coaches. Like a lot of times, guys play at a high level. They don't know how to un, how to speak it to this player so they can understand it because they 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 understand it. They only know one way. Don't exactly. even know. So like I, I get I get that, but there's now there's guys who I, I just think like guys who've been in it, been in the fire. I'm not trying to put anyone down or anything. Like if you play whatever. I, I'm just saying, like, it's guys who can who could coach. And and it, and they they haven't got the opportunity because you know how I go. Like it's whatever it is, but I don't know, man. I it is what it is, man. It's a lot of it's a lot of politics. It's about relationships, connections, and timing, so, like you said. Timing. It, there are a lot of guys that could coach, just like there are a lot of players who may maybe went unseen for a while. And you know, I think the same thing goes in business and anything else. It's, if you get a chance, sometimes you just need that one chance to show people. Um, you know, I'm very confident that if I got a shot anywhere, it doesn't matter if it's assistant or head coach, that I'm going to do a good job. Um, just because I believe that, you know, and I think it's about relationships and I think I'm good at that. I think I can make connections with coaches and with, with parents, with AAU coaches. And I know the game, the X's and O's, um, in game coaching, you know, I have a lot of experience. So, you know, one of these days I'll get my shot for sure. No, absolutely. And that's one of the biggest things now relatability. Like you gotta be like, you, you, the guy has to want to be able to play for you. That's yes. when you get the most out of your guys. When like, oh, I'm yeah. gonna go hard for this dude. Like he, yeah. like he really, you know what I mean? I'm gonna go hard. Yeah, I heard was a couple of years ago. Somebody told me that you know, coaching isn't necessary when you have tons of talents. Like you still need to coach. Players still need to be coached and told what to do. You just can't put players on the floor and expect greatness. You know, that's if that were the case, and Kentucky would win every year. Obviously, and not saying Cal is not a great coach, but it's not going to work like that every year. The chemistry part, guys buying in, um, whatever the, the case may be. So, you know, coaching matters for sure. It has to be some type of structure, some type of system, some type of guidelines to where, all right, this is what it is. Like, this is what we're doing. Like, we got the talent. Do it. Put guys in positions to succeed. That's what coaches do. I mean, you know. Absolutely. You got to put guys in the right place and know you know, who's supposed to have the ball at certain times in the game. And, you know, like you said, it's, there's more to it than just putting guys on the floor and, and getting the best players. Um, you got to know what you're doing for sure. Psychology, put the right guys around you on the staff, know how to, you know, make the, what make this player tick, what make him not tick, you know what I mean? Like and to wrap him up, give him a situation to where he can handle. You got you to know all that. You got to have that eye. You have to know personality. That's a big part of it. Knowing personality is what makes this guy tick. I can't yell at this guy like I can yell at this guy because um, it's not going to work. So, yeah, that the, the, the mind part plays a big part in it, especially at the high school level then with these kids. It's, it's crazy because they're so emotional. But, you know, as you get older and then the egos in the NBA, as you see, that's not, a, that's not easy. I can't imagine Steve Nash with Durant and those guys. They're obviously ultra-talented. But I can't imagine that's an easy job to be able to try to coach those guys. And and I mean, he, they making twenty more, more twenty million more dollars than you. Like like for real. Steve. Like we got this. Okay, I just said that. Like yeah, I got you. Steve. No, but for real, yeah, like, yeah. it's 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 just got to be a uh uh like they the communication has to be there. Like because when you, I mean, you're gonna talk it out. Like yeah, we're in agreement on this. Let's just. 
Like, you know, especially at that level. Come on. And Steve's been there and he's, you know, he was a point guard. So his mind, you know, he was yeah. a great leader. I mean, he was MVP twice, even though he yeah. stole it from Kobe. He stole it from Kobe. Stole him from that, Kobe, man. Stole him. That was, that was it. Steve's a great player. Stole it from Kobe. Great Got player. Him. But I think they trust him. He's been around the game for a long time. He's a smart dude. And, uh, you know, my money's on them to win it. I mean, they're they're stacking they're stacking the table right now with all those guys. Um, but everyone does it now, right? Everyone's been doing it. LeBron's been doing it. Everyone does it now. So you know, I was watching them last night, and or the other night, man, my man Joe Harris shooting that thing, boy. It, it, if you if you got Kyrie James, KD, and I know they're not playing right now all together, but I mean they added Blake. He's stretching the floor a little bit. Then they got a couple other guys. Man, my man Joe Harris, you just got to be ready to knock that thing down. He knocking that thing the down. Greatest role in the history of basketball. Just all those guys that just play with, yeah. Man. Green, Danny Green's had a great career. Just, just go spot up. Just work on your jump shot. Somebody, I, I saw a story. I think it was about a couple months ago. I was reading an article with his guy. I don't know if it was his workout guy or his coach or something. He wanted to try to, he wanted to work on his handles and do all the stuff. And he's like, no, we aren't working on any of that. Your job for you to get paid millions of dollars is spot up and shoot. And that's it. And that's all you're going to work on. That's all he's been working on for the last probably 10, 8, 10 years. And that's why he's had a lot of success. And, got, and as you know, you don't have to be the best ball handler. You have to be, you find a role by finding your niche, by doing something good, either Maybe you're a great rebounder. Maybe you're a great defender. Maybe you're like a Ben Wallace or like a Isaiah Stewart who just plays with tons of energy. You know, that's what, you know, you got to find your role. And even guys at the high school level, if I try to teach my guys that, I'm like, look at this guy. Look what he does. You don't have to be, because they all want to be Steph Curry. They all want to be Kyrie Irving. I'm like, no, you can be this guy or this guy and have success. And, you know, you just got to figure it out. You got to, if you want to be like, even have a glimpse of trying to be like that. You got to start at the, that young age to where you working on everything. But like you said, as you start going up, like your role is being defined at that high school level. Even, I mean, even middle school for real, you're a big man, you're a guard, like, you know, like, so, you know, these kids got to start early, man. That's just got to, if you really want to be on a whole nother level. Yeah. And the game has changed so much that everyone just, what you watch our, our kid, Andre, he shoots the ball. You know, normally back in the day, 20 years ago, they, the coach would be like, you get down low, all you're doing is rebounding and post moves. And if you get it outside, don't shoot. I mean, the, the game has expanded and changed so much that that's the norm now. You got like 6'5", six, 6'8", six, 6'9", six, 6'10", six, guys just wanting to shoot the ball a lot. So the game has totally changed. Yeah, my man Dre played his butt off today, man. He's good. Hey, he's, he's he could, you know, he could be, he could, he could go division one. He just got to keep getting better. He got the skill set. He got to get bigger. He, he run the floor. That's the biggest thing. Like you were saying, like, if he do that, like, dude, like he got, cause he got a good hands and good feel. Like he, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't understand that aspect of the game. Like just simple things like running the floor hard, every possession, you know, easy. This, 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 our guy, uh, Black, this is, you know, Black's a uh, player coming up for, for everybody on the podcast. It's, he got some young guys coming in looking to, looking to make some noise. So, yeah. Watch out for that. Last question, Black. And it's a goodie. <laughs> <laughs> who's your, who's your next head coach at your alma mater, Syracuse University? That's a hard question, man. Um, Right now, for the next 10 years, it's going to be Jim Beheim. <laughs> yeah. Coach is going to be, a, coach is going to be 80, 87, 86 on the sideline. Not even, what? What did you say? <laughs> coach, who am I going in for? What? <laughs> um, no, seriously. I, I, I don't know. Man. I mean, that's a million-dollar question. Yeah. Red Autry is the associate head coach. As everyone talks about him, they talk about McNamara. You know, they keep saying Hop is maybe going to come back. Who knows? It's That's a tough question, man, because coach is in the driver's seat and he's going to, you know, retire when he feels like, like you said, when he feels like 
he can't do it anymore because he, you know, he looks good. He says he feels good. And, um, and I do agree with what he said is that people quit sometimes when they think when people are trying to push him out or saying that you should retire and they quit too early. Um, because what's he going to do if, if he retired today, what would coach do? He would be so bored, man. So he would bored. be bored and that's been his life. And, um, you know, he's earned that right and he's going to coach, but I mean, who do you think? What do you I think? Mean, this is, I mean, my personal opinion, not that it matters, not anyone cares, but I think, like you said, those guys, Red, GMAC, those guys need to get the first look because they're, and, cause, and, and I think like, because Syracuse is a big name, big brand, like even with North Carolina, like I tell you, you want to look at the best candidate, but you have candidates who are alum and who are in-house that have that have that credibility to be yes. the head coach like you, you know what i mean so that's that's where the first look comes i'm not going out to look for chris beard and other, I, man these the, black going back to these are the dudes who may have never gotten that opportunity but they got that they have that like so i'm looking at red i'm looking at gene i'm looking at those guys who hop and we talk is it jay hart jason right. hart jason hart come i'm telling you bro like he's been in the game for a while doing that just like he deserves to be a head coach too well, as you know, one of the things is you have to be able to get players. Come on, man. You got to be able to recruit. Obviously, you have to be able to get players. And obviously, Red does a phenomenal job, <laughs> obviously, recruiting. He's been around for a while. He's been at Syracuse for a while. He's at Virginia Tech before. So, like you said, give a give somebody a chance. You will never know until you give them a chance, really. You never know. People have their opinions. You know, you have the armchair quarterbacks and people on Facebook with their opinions saying so-and-so, but they don't know anything about the game of basketball or what it means to how, how to run a team or what recruiting takes or building relationships with people. They don't know anything about that. So, you know, it'd be interesting to see in 10 years who the next coach is going to be. Yeah, it'd be interesting, man. It, it'll be, uh, yeah, it'll be fun to see my man been doing it for 77 years. Dude, 76, 40, 40, 44 years you've been there? 44 Man, years. 46, I think. At 47 or next year, I believe. I, don't, I may be wrong, but we right there. That's It's never been – I was looking at Roy Williams. He's been coaching at North Carolina for 33 years. Man, coach got him by 14 years or whatever. And co That's crazy, man. Like how that, that longevity is like – you don't see – you're not going to see that ever again, like ever in any no. And, and he's know. still he's still healthy. He's in good shape. And he's you know, it's it's amazing. That's really that's rare. That's it's, rare. That's it's rare. He I mean, regardless of what anyone say, he, he'll I be mean, missed when he's when he's gone for sure. He'll he's done not even just with basketball, but in the community and for the game, you know, helping get the biggies going. Done a lot. Done a lot. He he built it from he really built it from the ground up. I yeah, mean, grassroots. Up. No question. Grassroots from the beginning. No question. He's, yeah, it's he is Syracuse. That's no doubt. Yeah. yeah. No doubt. My guy, Black. I'm going to say it again, Black. Ryan Blackwell, a.k.a. Danny <laughs> Glover. Look, man. Hey, Mitchell Pritchard. My <laughs> man. <laughs> man, this dude called me Mitchell Pritchard, Mitch. I, I'll take that. He, he had a solid season, man. I'm you were a good in modern family, man. You, were, you did a good job. You are great. <laughs> I'm sorry for 2004. Who was his name? <laughs> Ruben Stutter. Oh my, that's that's my favorite one. Ruben Stutter. That's best stuff. Oh, come on, that's, man. That's crazy. That's uh, crazy. No, Black for real. Be great basketball player. Better person, man. I appreciate you, bro. You one of the funnest when you come on, bro. No doubt. Hey, man. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it.